Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus for bringing us here today. We are gathered together unto you, for unto the Lord shall the gathering of his people be. We are your people. We are the sheep of your pasture. Make us so that we bear fruit that reflects who you are, not who the enemy is. Thank you for hearing us. Bless us in our meeting today. May your presence be felt and experienced and transforming to provoke us unto righteousness. We'll ask of you if you have your Bible or if your Bible is in your device, if you could turn to the Gospel according to St. Luke. St. Luke chapter 10. We read from verse 27, but our account actually begins before verse 27, our leisure background. A lawyer stood up to ask Jesus a question and the Bible says he was tempting him. What can I do, he asked, in order to have everlasting life? or eternal life. It was a temptation. Jesus said to him, you know what the law says? And he answered Jesus, which begins our reading in verse 27. And he answering said, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy strength and with all thy mind and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, he the mean, meaning Jesus, thou hast answered right, these do, and thou shalt live. Verse 29. But he willing to justify himself said unto Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And Jesus answering said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way. When he saw him, he passed on the other side. And likewise a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. When he saw him, he had compassion on him and went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine and set him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And on the morrow when he departed, he took out two pence and gave them to the host and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Which now of these three, these three speaking about the priest, the Levite, and the man that was on a journey, which one of these three, which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? And he said, He that showed mercy on him. Then said Jesus unto him, Go and do thou likewise. We want to use for a subject today the question that the lawyer asked Jesus. Who is my neighbor? And that question would be turned around and asked to you, Who is your neighbor? For each and every one of us, we would immediately know what the word neighbor means because it will always mean someone other than ourselves. 
whether that person is across the street, left, right, behind us, a neighbor would mean someone other than ourselves. And the Bible is very careful in using the word neighbor because it exceeds the word uncle, aunt, nephew, mother, father, sister, brother. It exceeds the personal relationship because those would be considered inhabitants of the household or relatives far or near. We identify this man, the Bible says he was a certain man in the parable Jesus spoke. Whenever Jesus uses the word a certain man in the Bible, it means not just a parable or a story, but an actual event that took place and an actual person, a certain man. He was a man of means. We also know that by the fact that the Bible says that the thief stripped him of his clothing. Thieves don't steal cheap clothes bought at a grocery store. They steal valuable clothes. It must have been worth it for them to strip him of it. And they robbed him. They left him half dead. The Bible says that the man was traveling from Jerusalem, and this is significant. He was traveling from Jerusalem, the holy city, and he was traveling to Jericho, which is referred to as the city of the moon. Apart from it being the oldest town in the world. And Jericho is also the lowest place on earth. 230 meters below sea level and it's called Jericho as well because it was the early center for the worship of a lunar deity named Jarik which is where the word Jericho would come from when the man was traveling the journey is significant because the journey seems to move from the holy city to the city of Yarik. It's not a journey towards holiness, it's a journey away from it. He was stripped of his outfit, he was robbed, he was wounded, and he was left half dead. The Bible says by chance a priest came down that road. A priest is a minister that handles the affairs of God, that reads whether the Torah or the scripture and shows people about God and tells them about God. The priest came by that way, the Bible says, by chance. Whose chance was it? It was a chance for the priest to show that he is really a representative of God, not a talker about God. It was also a chance for the man to experience a difference in his situation that was deadly. But the Bible says that when the priest saw him, he actually crossed the road to the other side and walked past him. I can imagine the, if the man had seen the priest coming, his hope would have been elevated Thank God a man of God is coming. And then with sore disappointment would watch him cross the road to avoid his situation. If he had put his head down, he would raise it up again. Because a Levite, which would be almost like a priestly assistant, came also down the same road. And the Bible says, and if you read, the difference between what the Levite and the priest did is that the Levite actually walked and looked at the man and then also crossed the street and passed on the other side. They both crossed the road before passing the man. Perhaps an act of self-exoneration 
It's not my fault. I don't have anything to do with this. I'm not the one who caused it. I don't want anyone to think I beat up the man and left him in that state. I need to walk far away as possible so that people can see that my hands are clean. In situations like that, your hands may be clean, but your heart is extremely dirty. Especially if you have anything to do with God. And God being loved, the very first thing before you even open your mouth to preach anything to anybody. If you don't have the love of God, you should sit down. You have no message. There is no song that you can sing that pleases God. If the love of God is not in you. It's very easy to adopt Satan's version of love. Because it matches the life of sin. It matches the fallen human nature. And it leads to bondage. It leads to sin. It leads to unrighteousness. It leads to an unholy life. It leads to rebellion against God. But many times... That version of love is admired by us because it never challenges us to the righteousness of God himself. They passed him by. The Bible says, Then came a Samaritan man also going down the same road. I want you to notice as we go along that the Samaritan man is not a priest he is not a levite he is not a worker in the church he is not a choir member he probably doesn't own a big bible he might not be one that speaks in tongues he's one that you wouldn't expect him to be the one to make a difference when the man arrived he went to him directly he arrived with his own donkey, a beast of burden. He had luggage, which you would soon discover. A donkey can carry about 80% of his own weight. He's a beast of burden. Pound by pound, a donkey is actually stronger in bearing burdens than a horse. It's amazing that the man came with a donkey. There was something for the donkey to do. The donkey will carry the fallen man while the Samaritan carries the burden of the man himself. He was busy on a journey. He was not walking down that road looking for who has been beaten by thieves. Many times when we come across situations that need our participation to make a change we often are so busy the priest was busy he probably was rushing to the temple for prayer meeting therefore he needs to arrive on time for prayer meeting no time for a man that is almost dead on the street the levite probably is going to be the one to sing to to open the service too busy to attend to human beings whose life is more valuable than his choir or the preaching of the priest. Many times we place religion before human beings. We place the order and the program of our church before a person that is suffering and going through pain in their lives. So many people sit there with their sorrows. They sit there with their burdens. They listen to the priorities of the church. There's going to be a new building. A new glass window. There's going to be investment in a state of the art sound system. In the meantime, the broken lives are sitting there listening to the improvement planned for a building. Not their own lives. Just a place. For them to come and sit shattered. Shattered in their spirit. Shattered in their families. Shattered in their emotions. Listening to the priorities of the place that is supposed to help them. This man 
was on a journey to take care of his own business. He interrupted his previous intent of the journey. The Bible says when he saw him, he had compassion on him. He put himself in his place to feel what he feels. To be able to have that ability of empathy, not religion. You see, while the priests and the Levites are rushing to please God, God would have been more pleased that they would help a person that is fallen on the roadside. He had compassion. He springs into action. If I can put it in today's terms, he exercises what we would call today as phase eight. He cleans the wound, he pours in oil and wine, and he bandaged it. He didn't go to store to buy it. He had it with him. He had a luggage, remember. He used the phase eight approach. And he provides medical transport. I would say in many places that donkey would have been faster than an ambulance would show up in some locations. This man used his own donkey. If he was riding on that donkey, he would have had to climb down and let the man be on the donkey instead of him. He offered him his own place. And remember, in all this, he does not know who he is. Doesn't know which church he attends. Doesn't know which family he belongs. Does not know which language he speaks. He just sees a need. Thirdly, he takes him to a place that he can give him accommodation. The Bible says he took him to an inn. He booked the place. And fourthly, he offered general care. The Bible says he took care of him. Remember, this is not a relative. This is a man he doesn't know. He has never met him before. Fifthly, he offered him medical coverage paid by himself. The Bible says he took out money and paid the host of the inn. And then he says to the host, take care of him. And if you spend more money than what I'm giving you now, when I come back, I will pay you back. He puts himself under obligation to a total stranger. Do you know why? What kind of mind would make a person do that for a person that they don't know? I tell you one reason. You may not know him, but God knows him. You may not know her, but God knows her. And the spirit of God that knows the person would seemingly have prompted the Samaritan to say, forget what you know or don't know. Do what I ask you to do. Why is it that the priest and the Levite could not have done that? Why didn't they do it? After all, they are the administrators of the oracles of God in the sanctuary, in the tabernacle, in the temple. If today it would be the churches. It would be a man laying down in a place of utter agony and suffering. And suddenly lifts up his head and says, Oh, thank God, my pastor is coming. And the pastor looks and reverses his car and speeds off. Pastor is me. Pastor is me. <laughs> no, Sarah, you're not one of the big donors of our church. But let a rich man in the church even sneeze. He will declare fasting three weeks fast for God to touch and heal the rich man. 
because the rich man has a curious relationship with the bank account of the church and the eyes of man usually goes there why did the priest and the Levite not help him you see in the Jewish culture contact with a dead body is considered defiling which means you're not clean anymore they might have looked at the man laying down there and think he's dead if I touch him I'll be unclean so might as well I keep myself clean does that remind you of something human beings associate with polished people and successful people many people don't identify mad men on the street as their classmate even if they were but they will be quick to identify a movie star that they don't even know that they went to school together it's human nature we like to lift up our image and ego even if it means lying and using other people that are successful but to the one that is broken nobody seems to know him and even if they did they would deny it they avoided him to keep themselves ritually clean but in Mark chapter 2 verse 27 Jesus said this word he said the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath what are some applicable proclivities of the human nature as to why a person would bypass a situation like this without making a difference human beings number one are judgmental creatures maybe he deserved it they think who knows what he did and god is paying him back I don't want to interfere in God's judgment. He could be a wicked man laying there. Maybe he deserves what he gets. They never stop to think, do they themselves deserve God's blessing and favor? What if God was to share to everybody what they deserve? Secondly, it is maybe his evil has caught up with him. He was living a cunning life and he has been finally arrested, apprehended by the people he robbed and they beat him up. Maybe he is cursed. Let me not go near. I don't want his curse to jump on me. I'm clean before God. I'm one of the holy ones. Don't want to go near there. Don't want a curse jumping on me. Or perhaps one can look at it and say, you know what? Maybe it was just meant to be. And I don't want to interfere and change what was just meant to be. And one might even get very, very religious and say things like, he's probably not a Christian, otherwise he wouldn't suffer like that. He's not as holy as me. I speak in tongues half of the day. He probably doesn't know any other language than the one where he was born into. Man is extremely judgmental. And that is one category of thought that will obstruct and prevent the men and women of this generation from interfering, just simply being judgmental. Second factor. Men have, men and women of course, have a tendency to withhold help that doesn't meet their prerequisite or the criteria that will get them into motion. Such as, we have nothing in common. And this doesn't really concern me. And they may even pause to say things like, thank God it's not me. Be grateful to God that it didn't happen to them. Withholding help by also postulating that whosoever wanted this man dead might actually turn around and kill me for trying to keep him alive. So let me not get involved. Thirdly, 
he's a foreigner doesn't even speak my language it's no use helping this foreign man or woman after all we would like them even to leave our country dead or alive a typical Christian will withhold help and I've seen it here in this country where a team of pastors would held help from another pastor that was suffering in his family he doesn't belong to our denomination they said and many people will want to know what faith is this man that needs help I don't want to waste my help on some person with a strange religion I don't help this type some people say exactly what type and what type are you yourself others will put a religious spin on it brother Mike I would help in a situation like this but at first I need to wait to hear the voice of God coming from the cloud but whenever you see something that's good for you you didn't need the voice of God from the cloud to buy yourself a nice expensive car you waited for no voice from the cloud to spoil yourself with a sophisticated cell phone you didn't hear God arriving and his angels before you spoil yourself to an expensive dinner you seem to know what is good for you without a voice from the cloud but you deceive yourself with holding help because you just want to be sure that it is the will of God and if it is something will come from the cloud the same thing you never waited for before you spoil yourself with the good side of life lastly in that same category of withholding help the human mind says God will send him help in his time they might even shout a few prayers hello sir may the Lord help you in his due season I'm a little busy now but God be with you and bless you may he keep you may he cause his face to shine upon you offering fake blessings instead of participating in making a change in a person's life and condition the third category of those who would not make a difference in the situation of this man are people who would offer help conditionally conditionally and I'm talking about people that seem to be in a position to actually know God they will say things like hello sir I'm willing to assist you if you will first convert to my faith would you agree right now first of all to confess your sins and be baptized we live near an ocean we can go do that first then I'll help you by the time you finish that you will have to help a dead body because your condition was not met they say things like do you agree to join my church because life is nothing for nothing if I help you you must agree to increase my membership by coming at least we will be increased by one this year will you join my church first fill out the help me form and tick the boxes right there when your great grandmother was born fill out every item 
The man is laying in a half dead position. He can cry out, please help. My breath is leaving me. Please help. We will help you, sir. Complete the form. The help me form. Lastly, in that category, make a promise to me that you will go around town testifying about how good I am. What's in it for me? If I can find something in it for me, I can really be of help. These are the things that can hinder and cause a person to withhold help because certain conditions are not met. I don't want to be the talk of the town. Oh, Pastor, could you pray for me? I am really going through a situation. Pastor, could you pray for me? Sister, I am so sorry. I can't pray for you. I, I don't want Brother Jim to think there's something going on between us. You're so scared about what Brother Jim will think. You live your life inside Brother Jim's head. That you will not pray until Brother Jim promises that he will not think there's something going on between you and the sister. So the sister can die. So that you can have a good reputation with Brother Jim. What utter nonsense. Thank God for the Samaritan man. You know, Jesus is a good Samaritan. You just have to have a need to qualify. That's all. Not a baptism. Not a church membership. Not a good record of tithes. Not your righteousness. The Bible says even while we were yet sinners. Jesus Christ died for the ungodly. He says it would be a tremendous sacrifice. For a man to lay down his life for a good person. But in the case of Jesus. He laid down his life for the most rotten ones of all, the sinner, that he might bring them back to God by paying the price for their sins. And that includes all of us. Jesus Christ is the good Samaritan of the evil neighbor. He looks at you and he makes you wake up in the morning knowing fully well you're going to play your old tricks again you're going to play games with God you're going to walk past him like some rag that you would use to blow your nose he seems significant oh Pastor Mike that is so extreme I would never do that is it? How often do you respect him? How often do you love him by showing that godly love, especially to people that cannot love you back? I don't read here where the Samaritan said to the man, you just need to sign here that uh, as soon as you wake up, you'll pay me back for my services. It was to the glory of God. It was the spirit of God. There was not going to be a refund. It was not on credit. When a man recognizes how good God has been to him, he has absolutely no problem being good to another human being because he cannot even rise to what God has done for him. Jesus Christ has been doing this and he continues to do this today through the willing who are the willing if you desire to be the Samaritan of your age and your generation you must be willing to be saved therefore if any man be in Christ he is a new creature 
if you take your physical emotions to do the things of God, you're going to be so frustrated that you will quit altogether. You must be willing to be humble. You cannot save God in your pride and arrogance, lifting up yourself, trying so hard to get notice. You must be willing to be obedient to God, not to yourself. God wants to love people through you. A tangible love that makes a difference, that provokes action, that provokes sacrifice, that provokes a relentless effort to make the life of another person better. There may be many things that you don't have, but there are certain things that you do have. Never allow what you don't have to stop you from using what you do have, especially to the blessing of other people. You must be willing to be used by God for his will and purpose. You see, man has his own will. Man has his own purpose. Man has his own program. You can see the difference between the Levite, the priest, and the Samaritan. So the question I put to you today, if we can accept that you are like that Samaritan, if we can accept that the Spirit of God has touched your heart and your spirit. If we can just accept that you can see how beneficial it is to be like that. If we can postulate that you love God and you are a difference maker. The question would still remain. Who is your neighbor?